Hi, I'm Margaret D. Lacey talking to you from Oregon, and today I'm here to talk about Irish fever hospitals. We have a long history of hospitals that are uh, created to house particular populations or po uh, populations with particular diseases going back at least to the time when hospitals were created for patients with leprosy. Many British and European hospitals officially barred patients who had contagious diseases, but they often ended up with uh, contagious patients anyway, greatly to their dismay. But in the 18th century, fever hospitals emerged side by side with a changing model of acute fevers that was beginning to construct typhus as a specific and a contagious illness. This new model appeared in the mid 18th century with the work of John Pringle, James Lind, and a few other British authors. Although hospitals had often tried to separate certain groups of patients, the first civilian hospital wards explicitly created for typhus patients were established by John Haygarth in the Chester Infirmary in 1783. When I was researching the fever hospital movement, I began to study conflicts that broke out in England and the creation of fever hospitals in Manchester, Newcastle, Liverpool, and London in particular. I didn't realize that Irish institutions both predated and outnumbered the ones in England. Even Irish historians have failed to pay much attention to this story. Um, it's been overshadowed by the story of the famine. As you can see from the date over the um, doorway of the hospital to, um, for St. John's in Limerick, these innovative Irish hospitals have been hiding in plain sight for centuries. We're left with a mystery one that I certainly can't resolve. So I'm giving this paper in the hope that someone else will try to find an answer. Why were the Irish so successful in establishing these institutions for fever hospital, for fever patients? Typhus was probably a bigger problem in Ireland than in many other countries because of Ireland's climate, culture, and poverty but that doesn't really explain why people chose to tackle this particular problem, nor why they saw institutions as the answer. Irish historians have debated whether the Irish government was more interventionist than the English government during the 18th century. Several local historians emphasize the enthusiasm of Irish communities for institutions, the large sums that were raised relatively quickly and the support of the Irish government extending to the passage of Acts of Parliament guaranteeing uh, continued funding. Clearly, apart from the prevalence of a disease, one important factor was how doctors understood that disease. Without a clear disease construct, you really can't identify it as um, a common problem. This was a period when the nature of fevers and the definition of typhus was being hotly contested. Even if people could settle on a conceptualization of typhus, they would not see expensive institutions as a remedy unless they believed certain things about the disease. For example, that it was contagious, that they knew how to reduce transmission, or that they could reduce patients, uh, sorry, or they could treat patients more effectively in an institution than in their own homes. None of these ideas was taken for granted in late 18th century Europe or England. The accounts that were written by Irish fever hospital physicians suggest that these theories were contested there also. And I have been wondering whether the fault lines can be found among the various um, uh, parties to the debate or not. So one of the questions I started with was the background of the people who founded these hospitals. And um, with the exception of Killarney, which doesn't seem to have uh, left much of a mark on the documents at all. Uh, Killarney was mentioned in the parliamentary papers with the foundation date of 1800, 
um, I have not been able to find any documents or records that uh, docu that uh, prove that date. The first civilian fever hospital anywhere in Great Britain and Ireland that was created explicitly for fever patients was founded in Limerick by Lady Hartstongue, who was born Lucy Perry in 1780. Lady Hartstongue was a member of the Anglican establishment. Her brother was the Speaker of the Irish House of Commons. Uh, I describe him as a liberal nationalist. According to local historians, she was motivated by pity for poor victims of a typhus epidemic. In the paper that I submitted to you, I wrote that there's no evidence that Lady Hartstongue created this charity in the hope of reducing the incidence of typhus in the city. Uh, after I submitted the paper, I found an article in the Limerick Chronicle that cites a Limerick doctor who wrote a tribute to Lady Hartstongue at the time of her death in 1793. The tribute included the comment that she was, quote, resolved on bringing fever under one roof so as to lay the groundwork of an institution which, by confining contagion within its precincts, has preserved thousands from disease and death, unquote. So at least at second or third hand, we have information that she was motivated by some uh, idea of containment. The Fever Hospital in Belfast, established in 1797, was created explicitly to help control infection as well as to care for victims. The founders were James McDonnell and Samuel Martin Stevenson. McDonnell earned an MD from Edinburgh in 1784 with the thesis on resuscitation of the drowned, which was then a hot and somewhat controversial topic. Stevenson was a Presbyterian minister. Uh, he'd studied theology under the heterodox Professor William Leachman at Glasgow. His ordination followed his refusal to subscribe to the Westminster Confession, the foundation document of Presbyterianism, and divided his congregation. After a decade of serving both as a minister and as a doctor, he settled in Belfast, where he founded a dispensary in 1792 with McDonnell. In 1797, they added a fever hospital. Within three months, McDonnell himself, the housekeeper, the apothecary, the surgeon, and several other members of the medical staff had all contracted typhus and the hospital's work had to be suspended. McDonnell recovered and ultimately became the leading physician of Belfast. He also founded the Belfast Medical Society and the Belfast School of Medicine. Dublin's first fever hospital was the House of Recovery in Cork Street, also known as the Hardwick Fever Hospital. This was founded by a committee of Quaker merchants, um, including John Barrington, who later left the Society of Friends about 1801. Uh, Barrington, however, retained many of his ties to the Society of Friends and to Quaker philanthropy. As you can see from the table of founders, other hospital founders all seem to have come from similar communities. They were physicians and other members of the urban professional class. They were mostly members of old descent older descending groups such as the Quakers and the Presbyterians with a smattering of Anglicans. I've seen no evidence that the newer um, evangelical descending groups such as the Methodist were involved. The relative aspect, um, the relative absence of Catholics is interesting. Poor in Ireland were disproportionately Catholic and the Catholic Church was active in creating and maintaining medical institutions serving the poor in countries all over Europe. Catholics could not graduate from Trinity University, but they could and did attend Edinburgh and obtain Edinburgh MDs, and they studied in many continental universities as well before returning to Ireland. Despite fitful efforts by the College of Physicians in Dublin to control entry, Catholic practitioners were well represented in the medical profession but not in the ranks of hospital founders. Physicians with Trinity MDs also seem to be thin on the ground, whereas uh, physicians with Edinburgh MDs uh, were almost universal. 
With the exception of Lady Hart's tongue, in fact, most founders of the new fever hospitals in Ireland were members of the same small network of reforming physicians, and um, they were friends and correspondents as well, active in the effort to establish fever hospitals in the north of England and in London. There appears to be a denominational divide on the possibility of preventing epidemics of fever through state action, but we really need more work on early Irish fever theory and the early Irish medical profession to be sure of that. We also, um, it also appears that Irish communities were unlike their English counterparts in tolerating these new and alien institutions in their midst. We don't know how the poor themselves viewed the advice of um, on pre disease prevention and hygiene that was handed out very freely by members of the medical profession. But it does appear that many ordinary people had a fear of contagion and tried to avoid anyone stricken with a fever. There are many possible explanations for the easier establishment of these institutions in Ireland than in England, where every proposal met with fierce and sometimes successful resistance. Perhaps the Irish medical community, which was much smaller in size, uh, gave rise to fewer professional feuds over the control of local institutions. Perhaps local communities near the hospitals were too desperate and downtrodden to mount any effective opposition to their foundation. Perhaps the fever hospitals themselves were cited in less controversial places. Or perhaps typhus was so prevalent in nearby neighborhoods that the residents didn't really see the foundation of hospitals as a uh, possible uh, foci for new epidemics. Perhaps local historians have simply failed to report fully on local opposition because they review, viewed that opposition as either trivial or reactionary. In any case, this is a story that is still waiting to be told. Thank you very much.